So uh, our series is uh, about life, and uh, we're using as a text from the book of Genesis, uh, chapter 2, verse 7. And, uh, whoops, turn this on. Okay, there we go. Actually, uh, Genesis 2, 7 and one thirty. Then the Lord uh, God formed a man in the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And the man became a living being. And to all the beasts of the earth and all the birds of the sky and all the creatures that move along the ground, everything that has the breath of life in it, I give every green plant for food. And it was so. Uh, life is everywhere, as I've been telling you for the last several weeks. Uh, we uh, have an unquenchable thirst to uh, discover life, to preserve life. And in this series, uh, we talked about uh, what life is uh, for a couple of weeks. Uh, today we're going to begin a, a new arena uh, within life of what you can do uh, in life and with life, or to life. And then we'll discuss about how long is life and then the kind of life that we live. So uh, today uh, I want to address uh, what to do with life. Part 1. Acts chapter 20, verse 20. This is Paul. And he says, However, I consider my life worth nothing to me. My only aim is to finish the race and complete the task the Lord Jesus has given to me. The task of testifying to the good news of God's grace. Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, uh, we thank you for your word that is certainly meat and drink unto us to renew our hearts and renew our minds. Father, as I bring this word, I ask you to call to remembrance the things that I've studied, things that I haven't studied, that I might speak only the things that you were ordained for me to say this day. Open our ears that we might hear uh, what it is you, the Spirit of God, would say to us, the Church of God, this very day. This is our prayer, Father. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Everybody said it. Amen. Amen. I believe that each of us should uh, evaluate our lives uh, to take a, a stock of who we are, uh, take stock of uh, what we're doing and uh, with our most valuable asset. Your most valuable asset is not your car, your house, your clothes, your diamonds, your gold, your mind, or anything else. The most valuable asset you have is your life. And what are you spending it on? Uh, why are you here? Why are you still here? You know, I think it's a, it's a valid question that uh, we should ask of ourselves and ask it of God. What is my purpose for being here? Paul considered his life worth nothing uh, to him because he was willing to exchange his life and the things that he wanted for God's plan for his life. And that's, that's, a, that's a good place to be. You know, look, I j just use my life as you see fit, not as I see fit. Uh, he wanted to finish the task that he had before him uh, that God gave him to do, which was to preach preach the gospel of grace, and to uh, see that it, got, it, it was brought out. It said to testify to the good news of God's grace. That's what he wanted to do. So, uh, again, the question is, what are you doing with your life? You know, are you producing more than just uh, uh, another day, uh, counting the days until you leave this place? Or is there something productive? You know, in the business world, if you're not productive, they fire you. Can't afford to keep you. Can't afford to keep uh, unproductive people. Uh, one of the things uh, about in, in the business arena, a person needs to earn their wages and to be profitable for the business. If uh, the, our business happens to be the kingdom of God and the gospel of grace, you know, what are we doing? to uh, accomplish God's goal in this world. So uh, I want us to go in today and look in about several things that we can do with life because life can be lost prematurely. And I want to start here because it's one of the things that, you, that 
happens to life and that you can do with your life. And that's to see it leave before it's time. Genesis 6, 17. God spoke. He said, I am going to bring floodwaters on the earth to destroy all life under the heavens. Every creature that has the breath of life in it, everything on earth will perish. Uh, remember, we just read that God created everything that had the breath of life in it. And he said that he was going to destroy it all. Leviticus 24, 17 said, anyone who takes the life of a human being is to be put to death. Human life has great value, but it's, it can be removed before it's time. Uh, this, uh, this particular incident, uh, we're talking about uh, what God did with the great flood. That things had gotten so bad that the people were so evil that God destroyed all but Noah and his family. Uh, you know, we talk about we're sons and daughters of Noah, I mean of Abraham, Adam and Eve, but we're also uh, in the lineage of uh, Noah. There wasn't anybody that was alive except Noah and his family. Uh, there are two times that I know of that I'm 100% sure of that everyone who is alive believed in God. And that when Adam and Eve were created and when Noah and his family were rescued. They, were, they knew. What happened from Adam and Eve to Noah? I think people didn't do their job. They didn't do what they were supposed to do. And there were consequences of it. The consequences were that everybody died in the flood. Uh, what is their job? I believe our number one priority, if we don't do anything else on this world, our number one priority is to tell people about Jesus Christ. They need to know. From the time of Noah to now, I, I don't believe God would do this again because he said he wouldn't do it. But if he was going to do it, uh, it probably would save now's the time. When you look around at our world and the things that are taking place, uh, when, when you read something like I just read, that the number one, the number one cause of death in 2018 worldwide is abortion. That is an unbelievable thought. What's going to stop it? The number one thing that will stop it is the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because that's what changes people. That's what sets people free. That's how people change. I was looking at a, uh, a Pat Robertson uh, program uh, this week. Pat and I watched it. I saw the most amazing testimony. There was a young man, probably, I would say mid-30s, maybe, 30, 35, uh, he told the story how he uh, got involved in the homosexual lifestyle, that he uh, got involved in the, being a transvestite or in the, a drag queen, and he did that with his life and was completely sold out to it and was on the verge of having a, a physical operation that would have changed him uh, biologically, uh, so they believe. But he was uh, watching TV, and he... Uh, you're going to know this name. He was watching uh, Jensen Franklin. He's the guy who taught us the fast. And uh, he said, Jensen Franklin said, it doesn't matter where you've been or what you've done or what you're about to do, God can set you free and change you. And he said, for some reason, those words just, you know, offered him hope. He said, because he was, had no hope. And no hope of ever changing. And everything he tried in his uh, homosexual lifestyle, nothing gave him what he was looking for. And he said that uh, he, he didn't do anything right that moment. But I, he looked and found on, uh, on his uh, computer uh, an older broadcast of Jensen Franklin. He just brought it up to look at it. And he said, Jensen Franklin said almost the exact same words again, that God can change you so he took, uh, he said, uh, uh, Jensen Franklin uh, led in a little prayer. He said, he, he said the prayer, and he said he really felt different. He said, 
that something happened to him. It just changed him at that moment in time. I said, but he didn't change. His lifestyle didn't change. He continued the lifestyle he was in for a period of time. He didn't say how long, but he said for a period of time. He says, and finally God spoke to him, and God said this, if you will get rid of all the paraphernalia that you have, all your drag queen paraphernalia and all the things, all your homosexual stuff, if you'll get rid of it, I will set you free. And he said, I knew it was God. He said, I knew that it was God. I had prayed and asked God into my life, but I had to get rid of the things that I was hanging on to. He said he took all of his stuff, and he gave the implication that it was very expensive stuff, and he put it in garbage bags and went and found a dumpster and threw it in the dumpster. He said when he did that, he felt the release, and it released him. He started going to a little church, started uh, studying the Bible, uh, started learning things about God and what God could do in your life. He said, and eventually, uh, today, he said he's a Bible teacher. He proclaims uh, the message of Jesus Christ uh, to anyone who will listen. Uh, particularly, he talks to the homosexual LBGTQ uh, group and tells them that you can be set free. And when I saw that guy, I mean, I, I, I just go, had to choke back the tears because it doesn't matter where a person is in life whether it's your son John struggling, or your kids, or other, anyone, they can be set free from that. Who is ringing my phone right now? You, can, you couldn't hear it, but it rang in my hearing aids, all right? No, I got to keep it on me, because if they call them again, I got to hang it up. So, there is hope. But the Bible teaches, he said, how can they believe unless someone tells them? Somebody told me, somebody told you, somebody cared enough about you to tell you the story. Now, you might say that, uh, well, I've, I've told my friends and I've told my kids and I've told my parents, I've told everyone and they won't believe. They didn't believe the last time, but they might believe the next time. We just can't quit. We don't have to badger people, but we can continue to do it. Uh, Bob Lambert, uh, one of our own here, told me one day when he talked with his son, and, he, and his son said, I don't want to hear it. He said, listen, I have a responsibility to tell you about Jesus Christ, and you have a responsibility to listen to me. You are my flesh and blood. I brought you into this world. And he did. And his son listened to him. His son actually prayed with him. So uh, don't let people be in a situation like these poor folks were in the flood, who the breath of life was taken from them prematurely because of what they were doing. Now, some might say, well, Pastor, that was the Old Testament stuff, and people did that there. God doesn't do that anymore. This is long before the, the Old Covenant was given. And it gives us a view of how desperate things are. People will die. They'll lead a miserable life, and they will die without God. And they will first face eternity without God. So we, we need to do what we can to get the message out. That's what Paul wanted to do. Now, the the first time we see uh, God telling about death and, and why you can die prematurely, when God spoke to Adam and Eve, and he said, you must not eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, for when you eat of it, you will certainly die. So they had a consequence to deal with. Everyone who is not a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ has a death sentence. I told you about that a couple of weeks ago, so I don't want to go through that again. But they were tempted to disobey God, and they followed that and suffered the consequences of it. Decisions in life have consequences. The next time you see something, we see in uh, Genesis 4, 8, Now Cain said to his brother Abel, let's go out into the field. And while they were in the field, Cain attacked his brother Abel and killed him. Now, Abel didn't do anything 
to deserve death, but some ungodly person came, took his life from him. You don't know when some ungodly person could show up and take your life away from you before it's time. Now, I know that uh, there's a school of thought, and I, and I understand the thought, but I, it just doesn't hold up sometimes. People say, well, I'm not going to die until God wants me to die. I think we confuse the foreknowledge of God with the will of God. God knows, all right? But it's not always God's will. If some crazed person came in here and shot me right now, I don't believe that'd be God's will. I mean, God would know it, but I don't think that's God's will. For, for uh, you to harm someone in an automobile accident and they die, I don't believe that's God's will. God might know about it. So I, we need to be careful about how, what we say God's willing to do. Uh, there are a lot of things that happen that I don't believe God wants to happen. I don't believe God wanted me to lose my arm in that boating accident. I don't believe that was God's will. God allowed it to happen. God could have stopped it. I mean, you could say those things, but he didn't. And you got to be careful. It's a slippery slope you can get on. You can say, well, you start believing that when bad things happen to you, that God wants you to live a miserable life. And I don't believe that's true. I believe God wants you to live an abundant life. Jesus talked about an abundance of life. That's why he came. The gospel gives us abundance. What the gospel does with the knowledge of Christ living within you and dwelling within you gives you this ability. You know, that song said, uh, we, you, know, uh, you know, I can't do anything. You know, I'm down. I'm hurting. You know, what am I going to do? The will of God, excuse me, the grace of God within you gives you the ability to endure whatever it is you're going through. But that doesn't mean you give in to it. If somebody's trying to hurt you, you should fight to keep you and save your life. You ought to do that. Don't just say, oh, we're just getting killed me because this is going to be wonderful. God wants me to die and I'm ready to go. Just go ahead and shoot me. I mean, that'd be, they, they would lock you up for that. But having a mindset like that, you need to be locked up if that's what you think. Because you're a danger to society with that kind of a mindset. The mindset is, like Paul said in the scripture I read, I count my life to be worth nothing for the cause of what I'm doing. And you might say, uh, like uh, many years ago, these uh, young missionaries uh, went to... Uh, the jungles of South America uh, to evangelize a, a, a tribe that uh, had never been exposed to uh, the modern world and they killed them. I don't think it was God's will for those guys to die, but God took that event and used it as a worldwide story about how things can change because that guy's, one of the, one of the guy's wives, who husbands who died, that wife went back there and with others evangelized that tribe and the chief of that tribe that ordered that man's death confessed Jesus Christ as his savior and the, and the sin of murder that he committed against uh, those missionaries. So God can cause something to work for good, but I don't believe it's God's desire for you to die prematurely, all right? But it, but it can happen. It happened here with Cain and Abel. Now Cain... Abel died because Cain killed him. Cain was held responsible because he shed uh, lifeblood. Okay? So, Genesis 4.10, the Lord said, What have you done? Speaking to uh, Cain. Listen, your brother's blood cries out from the ground. It cries out to me from the ground. If God wanted Abel dead, why is God distressed about it? Think about it. He, he would be saying, I'm so glad that you killed Abel. I'm so happy now because you've fulfilled my will. You see the slippery slope you can get on? You know, if you start believing that. The scripture said, your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. God knows the, the life and the, the, the death of everyone who lives on the planet. He knows it. 
whether it's a child in the womb or whether it's a 95-year-old on a deathbed. God knows all that and more. He knows life and he knows how precious it is. God addressed the issue when it said that his lifeblood cries out to me. There's life in, in the blood. It's, it's uh, the air we breathe gives uh, the oxygen that spreads through our whole body. It's that life's blood. And when it's spilled, you know, you're watching a lot of TV or I know our uh, chaplains uh, are exposed to uh, people who commit suicide and, uh, and it's, you know, it's a bloody scene. Uh, you need that blood. When I, when I was in my boating accident, uh, I don't know how much blood I lost, but I lost enough blood that when they finally got me to the hospital, I, there was zero blood pressure. I had none. They couldn't get a reading of any kind off me. That's losing a lot. They put two bags into the town and filled me up, and I, I think they gave me six or eight uh, pints of blood to kind of get me going again. It was interesting. They, they couldn't give me any pain medication. Uh, they said, uh, oh, you're in a lot of pain. I said, no, I'm not. And they said, well, that's good because if we give you uh, pain medication, it lowers your blood pressure. And you got none, so we don't want to give you any more uh, to make it worse. So, uh, you know, there's something about the blood, that's the story of the blood of Jesus that was shed for us. That's his lifeblood giving, uh, his lifeblood cried out for the forgiveness of men. That's what Jesus did in the sacrifice he gave for us. So, uh, Humanity had become so corrupt, as we just uh, talked about, that God destroyed them in mass. He said, I'm going to bring floodwaters on the earth to destroy all life under the heavens. Every creature that has the breath of life in it, everything on the earth will perish. And every uh, animal, except those that were aboard the, 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 with Noah, uh, died. Now, That's pretty brutal. That's pretty brutal, isn't it? Uh, if, if you were God, would you do that? I don't know. I don't know what the situation was. But I, I know this. It's sometimes I see what's going on in our world, and I don't know how God holds his hand back. When you murder... Children in the womb with no thought of it being life. Why should you be alive? Why would, why would God let you live doing such a thing? We're held responsible for every, everything that has breath, for every human being. We're responsible for it. So I think as a people, we have a responsibility. What would, what would hold back God's hand? The same thing that let him put Noah and his family in the ark. He said, Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. I believe the only thing that holds that abeyance, the hand of God, from destroying the whole earth is people like you, the godly people who pray, the godly people who do what uh, they can to bring the gospel, the godly people who sacrifice it and do what's necessary to uh, give order to our society. I believe we're the ones with the Holy Spirit dwelling within us that hold back the hand of God. It says in the scriptures that when, the, when he that hinders is taken out of the world, he that hinders is the Holy Spirit within you. When he that hinders is taken out of the world, it's then that the wrath of God is going to be poured out upon the earth again. I know we don't like to hear that, but I'm afraid that's what the scriptures teach. And the only thing I know is the Bible. You know, I, I got a big kick out of David Jeremiah. I really love that guy. And uh, he told a story. He said, somebody asked him, time, he said, what do you do? He said, well, he said, uh, uh, he said I, I read the Bible. He said, uh, I memorize the Bible. I, uh, I teach the Bible. I preach the Bible. I write books about the Bible. And I even have my own version of the Bible. He said, I guess I just do things with the Bible. That's what I am. And that's the way I feel about myself sometimes. That's all I really spend any time knowing. Uh, I, I'm interested in other things, 
But the truth is, the only foundation I have to stand here and say anything to you is what the Scripture says. I don't, you know, every once in a while I give you my opinion, but my opinion is always based on my interpretation or understanding of the Scriptures. But other than that, I don't have a thing to say. I really don't. I, I like to learn things. I was watching this old house yesterday, uh, and they, the guy who, you know the guy in there that does all the plumbing? He explained how air conditioners and heat pumps work. I watched it four times. I was so amazed. I had no idea how that worked. None. I had zero idea. You know, you, you've had to buy these things called a compressor for your air conditioner. I didn't know what it did. It was just a compressor. Now I know. It, it compresses the gas to heat it up so we can go through the system and does what it wants us to do. Now, that's very interesting to me, but it wouldn't save a soul. You know? Now, I can tell you that God gave knowledge and wisdom to men to create that, and I'm so glad they did. I'm old enough to have lived in a world without air conditioning. I thank God for salvation and air conditioning. This is a stupid story, but I'm going to show you how stupid teen... You know, teenagers, how stupid they can be? A friend of mine had uh, bought a, a, a car, and it... Uh, we were going out joyriding, and it, it was an old car, all right? But the word was out that they were building automobiles with air conditioners in them. So we, and every once in a while, you see a car with the windows rolled up, and you knew it had air conditioning. In the middle of the summer, we rolled up the windows of that car, sweated ourselves to death, <laughs> driving around so people would think we had an air conditioned car. <laughs> yeah, teenage boys, I don't know. Uh, some of the things that you might do. Now, let me tell you about when death is acceptable, all right? Life for life. Someone who murders, that governments have the ability and the authority to bring judgment and take the life from them. There's a scriptural evidence for it, and then God gives that authority to governments. Go read the 13th, 13th chapter of Romans, and you'll see where that... Uh, that is done. If you're defending your life or someone else's life, you can take a life. That's in the scriptures. You can do that. If somebody tries to kill me, I can kill them before they kill me. But let me tell you what. I'm going to. You try to kill me, I'm not going to stand there and say, oh, thank you, Jesus. I get to go home now. You know? I've got guns and I, I use them. You know? I've got an arm here that it's, it's plastic, but it's heavy, I could beat you to death with it, all right? So, I, you know, there's a lot of things that I could do. I can bite, kick, scratch. I mean, I can be a, a terror to stop you from killing me. I'm not just giving in. And if somebody tries to hurt someone else, somebody try, tries to hurt my wife or my uh, daughter or my granddaughter or my children or my family members or my church members, I'm going to do something to preserve your life, you know? And I'll, and I'll take a life to save your life. And that's acceptable in the scriptures. I'd be willing to do that. You can take life during war. You know, remember, uh, oh, Sergeant York, all right? He had this big problem whether or not he should go to war, World War uh, I. There's a movie that was made by, about him. If you haven't seen it, you'll see it. It's a great movie. And he, he really was, didn't want to go to war. They were drafting him because he didn't believe that it was right to... to uh, kill. But he went to the scriptures and he, and he was able to understand the difference between killing and murder. And that the government wanted him to go and rescue the people of Europe. And he was one of the highly, most highly decorated uh, men during World War I uh, for what he did. So uh, w the government gives you uh, the authority through, ju through just wars. Not for land. You can't just go over and say, well, I'm going to take over this piece of land and kill everybody like uh, Nazi uh, Germany did. But when we as Americans went to stop the Nazis, that was acceptable for us to do that. Is that, is that God's best? <laughs> Heavens, no. No. But it is something that God gives us the ability to do. Okay? Y'all got that? All right. So what to do with life? Uh, life uh, will be the choices that you make. Deuteronomy, chapter 30, verses 19 through 20. This day I call the heavens and the earth as witnesses against you 
that I have set before you, I being God, have set before you life and death, blessings and curses. Now choose life so that you and your children may live and that you may love the Lord your God. Listen to his voice and hold fast to him. For the Lord is your life and he will give you many years in the land. Now, that'll renew your mind. Uh, Brother Robert, that's just going right here. Get you thinking, right? The quality of life that we have uh, is a choice that we make. This is our choice. God sets choices before us, and the choice we make sets the course for us. The Lord is life, and to not to choose him is death. I have set before you life and death. So we can choose. Anyone can choose that. I remember one time I tried to uh, uh, talk to someone about Christ. Uh, one of the very few times that I had this happen to me, and the guy told me that he didn't want to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. He said, no, nope, I don't want anything to do with it. He said, a bunch of hypocrites. You know, I don't want to be associated with them, and I do not want to be a part of them. I said, well, I appreciate your, uh, your candor with me that you would tell me that, but I want you to know if you don't believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you die, you will go to hell. And, it's a, and God's wrath is on you. And I read in the scripture in the book of John where it says, for those that believe not, the wrath of God abides on them. The wrath of God abides on them. I said, so as long as you understand that, he said, I understand that. I said, that's your decision to make. That was on a, it was a Tuesday or Thursday. The church used to go out and we call it witnessing the people. You know, we go out and visit newcomers in the neighborhood and new people who came to church, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, that Sunday, he showed up in church. He did. Uh, when the pastor gave an invitation for people to be saved, he responded and he came to the Lord. It was amazing. And because God's got a sense of humor, God called him to preach. So far as I know, he's still preaching the gospel this day. All right? So, uh, you know, sometimes people need to hear. Oh, I have to be careful. Because I know some of my grace uh, people would uh, go berserk when I say this. But uh, sometimes you just got to say the truth of what the scriptures teach. That if you will believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, you will be saved. But if you don't, you will be damned. And you're damned already. And if you don't receive Christ in your life, you will enter uh, the lake of fire. Now that's a fact, Jack. I can't change it. It's in the book. Uh, you know, I'd like to say, well, the Greek says it this way and the Hebrew says it this way. No matter what you, no matter what language you run into, it says that the unbeliever will be thrown into the lake of fire. That's it. Say, well, would God do that? No, God wouldn't do that, but that's a choice that people make. That's why it's our responsibility to bring the truth to them. If I hadn't been stopped, though, James Walter Hickman on August the 8th, 1972, at 1.30 in the afternoon, if he had not told me that, I might, I might be dead and in my grave and in hell right now. I don't know. But he told me and I was smart enough to know this because I told Jim when he, uh, when he told me about the gospel, I said, well, I need to think about it. I'd never heard it before. I'm 33 years old, never heard the gospel. Nobody ever told me. And I'd been into a bunch of churches. And he, when he said that, uh, I said, well, I need to think about this. He said, that's fine. You can think about it. But I just want you to know that if you die on the way to Slide Hill, because I was in Picayune, Mississippi, you will go to hell. And I said, Let's talk about this a little more. <laughs> and, it, and, I, and I received Christ into my life, and I haven't been the same since then. All right? So it's okay to, to just tell people the truth. Don't soft, uh, well, you know, God loves you, God cares about you, and God's sweet and lovely. That's all true. But all the blessings spoken of in the book of Deuteronomy, I told you a couple of weeks ago, all the blessings in chapter 28 are for believers. For the unbeliever, it's all the curses that are there. Okay? So receiving Christ in your life is the number one thing that uh, needs to be done. And if you're a believer, you can look for the promises of God. 
and the grace of God and the joy of God and, and knowing Him. But for the unbeliever, there's no good news at all. It's all bad news. There is no whole happy day. And if they die without Christ, they will have no life whatsoever. Choices have generational consequences. Looky here. Now choose life so that you and your children may live. As a believer, your kids have hope. They, I mean, they have a hope. You can, you can bring the gospel to them. For an unbeliever, we have generational unbelievers. I hope you're not guilty of this. If you are, God forgives you, so don't worry about it. But as a school of thought, it's, well, I'm just going to let my children grow up and choose what they want. This is the same kid that said no to you a thousand times. No, 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 no. This is the same kid that wouldn't listen to you. Same kid that you had a fuss at. The same kid that you had a, a spank their hineys occasionally, slap their hands. And if you didn't do that, that's part of your problem, all right? But if, if they are not living for Christ and they have children, those children have virtually no chance in the world of receiving Christ. The only hope they got is a godly grandparent. And for some of you in that situation, you're the only hope your grandkids got. For you to be able to talk to them, if your parents won't, if their parents won't do it, you can't let weeds grow. It's, it's like who was we talking with the other day? Talking about torpedo grass. You know, somebody. Once you got torpedo grass in your lawn, it's there until Jesus comes back. All right, you're not going to get rid of it. It take a miracle to get rid of it. I mean, just think of unbelief as torpedo grass. It just grows and grows and grows until some kind of way God intervenes and changes a person's life. So, people who live a marginal Christian life and just kind of, uh, you know, go to church on uh, Christmas and Easter uh, and, and they wonder why their children and their children are doing well in the world. Uh, Yeah, I, don't, I don't mind telling you a story. I just, I just went through it as to whether or not I want to tell you the story. But uh, recently I heard someone speak who's a, a fine Christian person, and they wanted to encourage uh, some, the churches to do some things, you know, uh, which, which are great things. I mean, what they, what they wanted the churches to do, and they brought the idea to me uh, and to Bob, and it was, it was a great idea. I mean, there's no question about it. There's only one caveat, only one fly in the ointment. This person doesn't, doesn't go to a church. They skip around from church to church. Now, how, how is that going to work? How are you going to be uh, credible to a church when you don't believe in church enough to blow them and be a part of it? You know? So it's important what we do and the choices that we make and, uh, because uh, what we do, our families will follow. When I was a little boy, my mother and dad used to take me to the church that they were familiar with, which happened to be the Lutheran church. And I remember my little cousin Gail and I, uh, we were like sister and brother, uh, we used to sit in the front row of the church, and right across the street from the church was a little store. And we used to go over there and buy one of those big uh, jawbreakers, and we would sit there with a big jawbreaker in our mouth every Sunday and listen to the preacher. Well, my mother and dad decided that they didn't want to go to church anymore. So, and they sent Gail and I to church. Well, it just wasn't a lot of fun with mom and dad out there. And, you know, I, I guess our jawbreakers didn't taste as good. And uh, one Sunday, my mother said, uh, well, you get ready because you're going to go to church. I said, no, I'm not going to church. And she said, yes, you are. I said, no, I'm not. And she said, why aren't you going to church? I said, because your daddy don't go. I'm not going. And I quit going to church. You know what? They didn't have a leg to stand on. Years later, my little next door neighbor, little neighbor boy, invited me to go to church with him. We were the same age, 
And I wanted to go to church with him. You know why? Because he, see, he liked it, and I liked him. And so I went to church with him. You know? Now, I didn't get saved because the church was taking me to it, but it got me going in the right direction. The point I'm trying to make is that our families will go the direction we're going in. We set the pattern for them. And so we need to set a good pattern for their lives. We need to choose blessings and not curses. We need to choose the good things. We want to choose to live a good life. We choose to do the right thing. Does that mean you walk around with a little halo over your head? No, but it does mean that uh, in your basic fundamental core that you do the right thing and say the right thing. And you don't uh, live a, that word hypocritical life. You know, live in one way and, and saying something different. Because if we care about our families, they will follow the way that we'll go. It says here that uh, in the last end of last part of this, it says that you might love the Lord your God, listen to his voice, hold fast to him. For the Lord is your life, and he will give you many years in the land. I think one of the benefits of being a believer is uh, you have a good long life. You know, a life filled with joy. And if, if nothing else, living a Christian life will keep you from uh, some of the things that will kill you prematurely. Smoking will kill you prematurely or take away your breath so that you can't breathe good. You know, drinking whiskey and getting drunk. If, uh, can a believer do that? Well, sure they can. Will they die early? Well, sure they will. You know, will they be sick? Yes, they will. You know, that's the choice you make. Choose you this day. You want blessings or curses, you know? So the lifestyle of a sold-out Christian will extend their life just for the fact they're not doing things that will kill them. Does that make sense? So some of the things you can do in life is uh, take care of it. We can't let circumstances of life determine our attitude. That song we did, let me, let me put it to you this way. While the sun is shining, while, while everything's going good, tell God that you're on his side. Just tell him. Say, God, I'm on your side. And I'm going to follow you the best way I can. And I want you to know that if I ever say anything contrary to this, God, you need to know this. I have lost my mind. I have gone completely crazy. I need to be locked up in the insane asylum because there's something really, really wrong with me. All right? And the reason you do that on a sunshiny day is because when the rain comes and the flood comes and things are really terrible, it's hard to say that sometimes. When you're trying to breathe, it's hard to say, God, I trust you and I believe in you. When you see your family going in the wrong direction, it's hard to say, God, I trust you and I believe you no matter what happens. So you tell them on a good day, so when a bad day comes and you do get the diagnosis, well, uh, I don't, uh, the doctor says, so, well, we've done all the tests and uh, you've got cancer or you've got some incurable disease, you've got ALS or you've got something debilitating uh, and you need to get your affairs in order. I well, just went to the funeral last week. We told you about it, of a guy who got that news from the doctor. Well, get your affairs in order. And he did. He got his affairs in order, and he died well. He's a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. But you don't make the decision to die well when the doctor gives you the diagnosis. You make a decision to die well when you believe in God and you trust Him and you're in your time of prayer, and you tell God how you feel about Him on the good, sunshiny day. Because it's hard on the bad days to do that. It's not impossible, but it's difficult. Okay? So, so uh, look at what our, our buddy Job did. You know, Job uh, went through, oops, I just went past it. Job said, uh, now he had been through hell on earth, no question about that. And he reached the point, he said, I despise my life. I would not live forever. In other words, I want to die. Uh, let me alone, my days have no meaning. That's what hard times did to him. And his friends who gave him bad advice, including his wife. 
But he, but he finally came to his realization that he was wrong about that. And he said, uh, though he cursed me, still I will love him. You know, that's what he came down to. So uh, we need to learn to, in hard times uh, to choose God and to give our life to him day by day. I'm going to stop right here with this uh, scripture that I started off with about Paul. Because I think Paul is a, is a great role model for I consider my life worth nothing to me. My only aim is to finish the race and complete the task the Lord Jesus has given to me. What is the task God has given you to do? David Jeremiah was talking about the subject this morning uh, in a sermon that I've listened to him. You know, if you don't know what to do, ask God. Lord, what would you have me to do with my life? I believe one of the things that the Lord would say to you that to find his plan for your life is to search the scriptures because in the scriptures, the inspired word of God, that you will hear the Holy Spirit speak to you and tell you what it is you should do. Should you be like Paul and give your life as an evangelist, an apostle? Uh, you know, that, that was his calling. It wasn't mine. You know, I don't have the same calling Paul has. I have my own calling. You know, I can't fulfill your calling. I have to fulfill mine. And you say, well, I don't have any calling from God. Well, maybe you're not listening. Maybe you haven't asked. Or are you brave enough to ask that question? Just to ask God, God, what do you want me to do with my life for you? There was a story of a guy who was a very successful businessman, a uh, multimillionaire. Very, very successful. And he believed that he was going to quit his business and go uh, be an evangelist. And he went to be an evangelist. And it was a terrible experience for him. Nothing went right. Nobody would listen to him. And after several years, you know, he, of uh, trying to be an evangelist, he, he spoke to God. He said, God, I thought you wanted me to go out and preach the word. God said, I never called you to be an evangelist. I called you to be a businessman. I called you to take the money you've got and give it into the cause. And he said, oh, I didn't realize that. Went back to his business, very successful, and he ended up giving away 90% of all the money that he made. He kept 10% for himself. He tithed for himself. Say, wow, that's amazing. I would love to do that. Well, if God called you to do it, why don't you do it? <laughs> if he didn't call you to do it, don't do that. You know, maybe it's to go visit people in a nursing home. Maybe it's to write newspaper articles. Maybe it's just to, 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 to be an impact in your family. I mean, I don't know. But God knows. And you know what? I think sometimes deep inside you know too. You kind of know. You know? And, and pray this prayer. Lord, open the door. Open my mind. Open the door. And you open the door and I'll walk through it. That's the way I've lived my life as a Christian. Lord, you open the doors, I walk through them. You don't open the doors, I don't do nothing. I, I'll sit like a, 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 a frog on a rock. I won't do anything unless you tell me what to do. And you know what? I am so busy, I don't know what to do next. <laughs> but I've learned to do what God opens the doors for. So that gives you good choices. So... Uh, I'm going to stop there. There's more I have to say, but I intended to continue this anyway uh, next week. Uh, we'll talk about uh, how life can preserve the future and, and some other things next week. But uh, I think we've got enough uh, for today. I've over-preached myself, but that's okay. Uh, I didn't have any place to go. Uh, you know, there's no, uh, uh, what's the name? Fatties is not uh, going to get my money today. I'm not going to Fatties to eat. You know, I'm going to go to uh, some place that serves soup and salad. And, uh, and, and be happy with that. Any questions, uh, comments, or anything before we uh, go? Yeah.